so yeah, I'm Patrick Beckett. Um, I've been with Biofiltro now for about two years and just wanted to compliment those great presentations that Pius and Gilbert just gave with a little more information about our company, our history, and uh, our experience working with dairies to treat liquid manure. So Biofiltro started in Chile. Um, our technology was first developed in the early 90s. Uh, it was actually the brainchild of a Chilean professor who was uh, trying to treat activated sludge with vermifiltration technology. Our system, which we call the BETA, it's uh, patented and it's now been installed for wastewater treatments in more than 200 projects around the world. Um, many of these are in South America and North America, but we've also got some experience in Europe as well as some Pacific regions like New Zealand. Uh, we started in the United States in 2015. We currently have 19 operational plants uh, in the West Coast mainly. California, Oregon, and Washington. We treat wastewater with our systems uh, ranging from uh, rural sanitary, wineries, food processors, um, milk processing plants in South America, not in North America yet, uh, but we've done livestock operations in North America. We commissioned seven new plants in 2021, and we've, we've got quite a few in our pipeline for this year as well. In terms of uh, dairy projects, the very first project we did was commissioned in 2015 in Hillmar, California at Finelli Dairy. This was a demonstration project that I believe was uh, funded by the USDA. And uh, since that time, we've you know, collaborated with multiple third parties to research our system in the context of treating dairy manure. Uh, this has included folks from UC Davis like Frank Mitloner, um, folks at WSU like Joe, Pius, Gilbert, who have all looked at um, greenhouse gas emission reductions as well as nutrient removal. We've also worked with some private third parties uh, studying greenhouse gas and nutrient removal at the Finelli Dairy. Um, vermifiltration has now been approved by the California Department of Food and Ag as a valid practice to reduce greenhouse gases and it can be funded by the AMP program in the state of California. And overall, as a company, we currently have three systems operating at dairies. One is the aforementioned Finelli Dairy System, which uh, continues to be ran as sort of an internal research and development site. Um, we have Royal Dairy, which is our full-scale system in Washington that I'll speak a bit more about in a moment. And then we currently have a demo unit, very similar to what Gilbert just showed you, that is in operation in Mountain Home, Idaho. So this is an aerial view of uh, Royal Dairy near Royal City, Washington. They have, I mean, the herd size is probably a little off at this point, but approximately 6,000 milking jerseys, 4,300 free stall and 1,700 dry lots. You do not see our system in this photo. This is just the farm. Um, on the right there, you see the free stalls um, a collection pit here for the liquid manure and the lagoons. And really the relationship with Royal Dairy started when the owner, Austin Allred, um, came to a booth of ours at the World Ag Expo in California. And so there were some particular pain points at Royal Dairy that Austin was looking to address. The, the nutrient management plan requirements that he was trying to conform to he wanted to grow the herd size and increase milk production, but didn't want to add land to deal with the increased waste production. Uh, he had the ongoing cost and liability of hauling liquid manure off site. I spoke to him about this recently, and I think he said he had like seven trucks per day hauling off liquid manure. And there was and continues to be an industry call to action to reduce the carbon footprint of milk production. And based on our experience at the Finelli system, um, you know, these are things we thought the beta system could address for Royal Dairy. So this might be a little busy. I'll try and walk you through it. This is just a process flow diagram, essentially, to show you where our system fits in to the overall manure management at Royal Dairy. So if we start here at the far right, maybe you can see my cursor. These are the, the flush towers. So the water comes from these, flushes the lanes in these barns. All of that is collected in a central settling pit here. 
And then from that pit, it's pumped up to a primary screen. I think it's about 3000 micron in terms of the solids it's separating. And before the beta was installed, before we started working with Royal Dairy, um, after that primary screen, the liquid manure went into these settling lagoons, and that was the extent of both their solids handling and their treatment of the manure. Um, since we came on board and started working together, it is necessary to ensure uh, proper solids handling upstream of our system, just because it can cause issues with the irrigation nozzles, for example, if you don't and, and inorganic solids like sand, right? We, worms do not uh, break down silicate minerals. So it's best just to remove those before it gets to our system. So we subsequently um, installed a sand lane to settle out some of those larger inorganic solids, as well as a secondary screen here that's about 800 microns. From there, the water is pumped into this holding, the smaller holding lagoon and then into a small holding tank that's in this building right here. So this is the water that gets pumped out and applied to our actual filter systems. In this building, we also have our pumps and an HMI. The HMI is basically a large touch screen that our operators can use to both see the status of things like pumps, uh, water levels in various parts of the treatment process, we also utilize inline sensors to measure things like total suspended solids and temperature of the wastewater. Um, and they can also you know, control pumps from here. So from that holding tank, the water then is, it's going out to, you know, we call them treatment beds, essentially. They have lengthwise uh, irrigation pipes with nozzles along those. Um, the filter itself is very similar to what Gilbert showed you. It's about a three feet deep bed of wood chips. The upper part of that is inoculated with worms um, and, and microbes, of course. And the water is applied over the top. It percolates vertically. Um, there's a rock layer beneath the wood chips. And then it gravity flows into a treated water tank. From there, that treated water is pumped into this larger secondary lagoon and you know, significantly cleaner, both in terms of the organics and the nutrients, and that can then be recycled to continue flushing operations at the dairy. Um, I'll speak a bit more about this material we see to the far left. This is what we call vermi product. So as Pius was mentioning, there's worm castings. Our vermi product is, is basically every 18 months at Royal Dairy, we completely remove this wood chip layer of the filter. At that point, it's a mixture of worms, worm castings, so worm poop, and undecomposed wood chips. A significant amount of the wood chips have been degraded, but there still are some that aren't. We remove that, um, and then we replace it with new wood chips, re-inoculate it with worms. And I'll say a bit more about that later. So this is an aerial photograph of the entire beta system at Royal Dairy. Um, we, we built it out in phases. So typically with a new customer, if they're interested in using our Vermi filter, we install a pilot system that's about the same size of what Gilbert studied. It's a shipping container unit. At Royal Dairy, Austin wanted to build something a little larger and a little more, I guess, realistic for the initial demo. So you see here in the bottom right hand corner is a small concrete basin. That was the original system that Austin installed. And once he was satisfied with the results from that, we the second phase of construction was building out these three beds right here. And as you can see, you can see those lengthwise pipes there. And actually this one on the far right is, is being irrigated in the photo. We then eventually built out an additional four beds so that we could treat the total effluent from Royal Dairy. And so the total system size is about 310 square feet of treatment surface area. In terms of the performance, uh, the removal of nutrients and organics and solids, um, this data that you see here, these are percent removals of each one of these uh, parameters. This data is for the full system. So since we've had seven complete beds in operation, we do monthly grab samples and this is from, I think, May 2020 to the present day. That's what these numbers were calculated from. 
And based on the performance we've had at Royal, um, the required land application area has decreased by an order of magnitude. So from 4,000 acres down to 400, it's completely eliminated the need for offsite trucking of the liquid manure. An additional benefit you get with our system is since it's aerobic, um, you reduce the uh, formation of things like hydrogen sulfide as well as ammonia. And because there's such a significant reduction in the organic matter in the treated manure, there are health benefits to the animal when you're using that water uh, to recycle and flush with. Now, uh, an important thing that we do measure are the total volatile solids. Um, the volatile solids correspond to the potential for methane emissions from the wastewater, as, as Gilbert mentioned earlier. And in particular, since at Royal Dairy um, and as a company, we participate in, voluntar in generating uh, voluntary carbon credits, the total volatile solids is what we monitor to determine the quantity of carbon credits we generate on an annual basis. So, you know, by reducing the amount of total volatile solids by 77%, that means that we are 70, we're reducing 77% of the potential methane that could form if that were to just sit in a lagoon untreated. Um, Royal Dairy's carbon credit generation has been verified by VERA, a, a registry under IPCC protocols. Their 2020 voluntary credits were sold to a global dairy company, and right now we're in the process of finishing up verification of the 2021 uh, credits. And just a bit more about the, the carbon footprint of manure lagoons. On the right, you see a pie chart of uh, the greenhouse gas inventory for the state of California. And as you can see, a significant fraction of that comes from emissions uh, based on manure uh, held in anaerobic lagoons, for example. In, in most US dairies use anaerobic lagoons. It's uh, the manure is the second largest contributor to a farm's carbon footprint. And it's that long-term storage of the organics, the volatile solids, and its decomposition that leads to the methane emissions. Uh, it's estimated that for freestall barns, anaerobic breakdown of organics can generate six to nine tons per milking cow of CO2 equivalents. Uh, this is a graph taken from a recent study. It was published by Sabina Dore et al. Um, so this was based on the Finelli dairy system in Hillmar, California that we had. And so even though we use total volatile solids to determine the carbon credits, um, this study was doing actual direct methane emission measurements. So on the left-hand y-axis, you see the methane flux density. So this was measured both at the surface of the vermifilter as well as the lagoon at this dairy. And then on the right-hand y-axis, you see the percent reduction in emissions. Um, there's some variation, of course, throughout the, the course of the study, but most percent reductions fell between about 95 and 100 percent. And based on our experience, the, the carbon credit generation potential, it'll depend on what type of cow we're talking about, whether it's open lot or free stall. But for a free stall, it's about 6.5 metric ton CO2 equivalents per year. Um, and about three ton CO2 equivalents per year for a open lot milking cow. Um, won't say too much about this. I think the picture um, speaks for itself. So on the upper part on the left, you see the large lagoon. On the right, you see the smaller lagoon. This was before the beta system was installed. This is what the lagoons looked like. So a lot of accumulation of solids, uh, pretty dirty. And then what you see at the bottom are the lagoons after the installation of the beta. This is where the treated water is now stored and reused for flushing. Uh, coming back to the vermi product, um, which again, it's not just pure castings, it's a mixture of castings, worms, undecomposed wood chips. At Royal Dairy, we, we generate about 22,500 cubic yards of this material every 18 months. So we will come in, we will excavate the material from all of these beds and then replace it and re-inoculate it with the biology. And it's, 
so worm castings have pretty special properties relative to just synthetic fertilizers or even conventional thermophilic composts. I think Pius spoke to this a bit. And a lot of it has to do with the uh, diversity of the microbiology in the material. So worms, as they ingest material and excrete it, they're, they're changing the structure of the microbial community. Um, we have offtake agreements in place in both the Pacific Northwest and California to sell this material straight out of our systems, no further processing. Um, and on the low end, you know, it can command a price of about $50 per cubic yard. And there's just some general projections of how much material you can produce based on cow type. In terms of our business model, how we work with farmers, um, we, we prefer that the farmer provides some solid separation and a bedding recovery system if needed. Um, that they do the work to integrate their current settling lagoon to our system, so to get water to us, and then does the land and earthwork necessary to install the worm beds. And a, a rough rule of thumb you can use to size a system is you need about 100 square feet per freestall cow in terms of treatment surface area of a beta system. We can take care of the engineering, the construction management, and commissioning of systems as well as the, the project validation and verification for greenhouse gas reductions. We, we have experience doing that. Um, lots of experience on the operations and maintenance side of our systems, which would include harvesting and replacing the Vermi product periodically. So in closing, um, you know, at very low cost or no cost, farmers can get a system that provides treated water to their dairy. Um, we biofiltro through the sale of the carbon credits and the Vermi product. We can cover the operating expenses and then pay back the capital expenses to build the system. And then after a certain number of years, the farmers can actually get ownership of the infrastructure. And this is adjustable. It really depends on to what extent a farmer wants to invest in the system upfront. 